The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening and uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the webinar on the non-pharmacological interventions to prevent secondary fractures. My name is Masaki Fujita and I'm the Science Project Coordinator at IOF. I'm also coordinating the Capture the Fracture program. Uh, we are lucky to be here today with Professor Christina Akison, who will present on this uh, topic. Christina Akison is Professor of Orthopedics and Senior Consultant at the Department of Orthopedics at Scone University Hospital Malmo and the Faculty of Medicine at Lund University, Sweden. Now, before we begin, I'd like to remind you that attendees are muted. If you have any questions, please feel free to type your questions into the question box you see on your screen. Uh, they will be collected throughout the webinar, and I will voice to them to the speaker towards the end. Uh, now, Christina, on to you when you're ready. Thanks. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm pleased to hear, be here and give you this presentation on non-pharmacological interventions. Fracture risk in the short and long term needs interventions in the short and long term. So the, what I'm going to cover here is the next fracture, the complexity and the causality of fractures, aging, life expectancy and frailty, the rationale for interventions and evidence for interventions in this area. So just let me start here. We have to always consider age and then look at where, where the fractures do occur. So if we look at those who are between 50 and 54 years of age, we can see in the green, the 39% mark, that the majority is dysteroidous fractures. And a very small proportion, 4%, are hip fractures. While when we age, we see that the majority are actually hip fractures and other fractures, while the forearm fractures are a much smaller proportion. And this we need to keep in mind when we discuss uh, intervention and prevention of the next fracture. We all know that the first fracture is very important. This is just data after hip fracture. We used hip fracture as the index fracture, and many of these patients had had a prior fracture, but that wasn't our interest. Our interest was to see how many new fractures a hip fracture patient would get during the remaining lifetime. And here you see how it is for women with hip fracture and is stratified by age. In the purple or turquoise here, it's all those who had a fracture during the first year. And you can see that it's 15, about 15% 15 who have a fracture and they're most common in this, this age range. On the other hand, if we're relatively young, up to 50% get a new fracture during the remaining lifetime. And these are patients still with a high mortality. When we look at men, we see a similar pattern, quite a few in the first year, but overall fewer who get a second fracture. And this is most likely because of, it, of uh, mortality, because the very old, they die very quickly. Uh, and, but we see that the risk is increased for at least 10 years. This is another study we have done and looked at the imminent fracture risk. We looked at those who had a, an index fracture, checked whether they had had prior fracture and how many new fractures they had within 24 months. Because this is a, a window of opportunity to start interventions. And here the first picture you see is the age stratification, the index fracture, what type of fracture they had. And you can see, for example, that when you get to the age of 80, almost 40% have had a, a prior fracture before they have their index fracture. And that's very similar regardless of what fracture you have. But then this is the proportion who get any subsequent fracture within 24 months. And it's around 10% of these patients. Interestingly is then what type of fracture do they get within the 24 months? And you see the hip fracture patients, they get 48 or half of them get a new hip fracture. But I like to emphasize the, the in, uh, when the humerus fracture is the index fracture, then we see that all up to 66% of them get a hip fracture. 
this indicates that we should probably have prevented a fall because balance is probably more affected in those who have a humerus fracture than in many other fractures. And this brings us to the causality of fractures and what we should then target when we look at the interventions. I'll start out saying something about bone strength, but that's going to be very minor in this presentation because that's also where we look at pharmacological interventions and that's not the topic of today. But on the other hand, you can see all the risk factors for falls and the impact of a fall where we have a chance to do a, man, a large a variety of different interventions. This also shows that whatever you choose is going to be very hard to evaluate how effective they are uh, to get a best, a highest level of evidence. Nevertheless, we have to remember this because when we look at fragility fracture and bone mass, we all know that particularly for hip fracture, bone density do explain a lot, but not everything, because a large proportion of the fractures occur in patients who only have reduced bone density, but not as low as severe osteoporosis. This is why I think it's important, it's important to remember that there is a relative importance of risk factors when we look at this. So some of them are highly dependent on BMD, for example, the tibral fractures, and they occur relatively early. So in these patients, we do have to look at specific interventions to avoid recurrence, while in those who become older, it's still BMD dependent, but there, the independent factor becomes much more prevalent. And that's where we see the non vertebral fra fra uh, fractures. And of course, the fall will be one of the most important factors in this part. So, all of you probably know that we have risk factors for osteoporosis, but these are also the targets for interventions. And I have split them up here by looking at those who are rel related to osteoporosis per se, to bone density or bone strength. And you can see that increasing age and the being a woman are among the most uh, important. And that comes out also in the instruments we use to assess fracture risk. But you see another one, several others that are actually possible to uh, change by interventions such as smoking, nutritional st status and physical activity. They are also important. But then osteoporosis is one of the most important risk factors for fracture. And there are, of course, similarities such as age and being a woman. But we also have others such as fall propensity. But you can probably list many more and the ones I showed uh, previously. So these are our targets and this is what we need to look at. But I will focus a bit more on falling. And as you know, we can separate them into intrinsic factors and extrinsic factors. And here are the, a list of a number of those that are intrinsic factors that are related to patient per se. And when you see all of them, you can also see how difficult it is to pick out one single one that would be the most important for falling because they're often combined a number of them. Nevertheless, the more we know, the better we will be at intervening. While the intrinsic factors are also both into extrinsic and environmental. And environmental factors are those who are often related to hazards indoors or at home, or hazards outdoors, depending on where you live. Such as in Sweden, where we sometimes have snowy and icy conditions, it will make a difference. But the majority of fragility fractures will occur in those who are actually indoors or at home. And we do have uh, safe homes as a project where people get information on how to avoid those. Those are most relevant for those who are very aged. Well, they're not as relevant for those who are in the 60s and early 70s. But it, all of this tells us that to, to be effective, we need actually a multi-professional team to address the non-pharmacological interventions for fracture. I also like to highlight the life expectancy. 
because we do have a many years where a patients are at risk of a fracture. This is just a table from Sweden, and actually the mean age of a Swedish woman is 83, and that's also the mean age for uh, mean life expectancy, which is also the same as the mean age for having a hip fracture, similarly for men. But look at the remaining life years these, these people have, and this gives us a long time to intervene. And when we come back to the data where we can see how effective our interventions are, we will see that many of these studies are very short term when you keep this perspective on actually how many years we really should work on prevention. And with aging, we also have to address frailty. Frailty is not very well defined, but it's a composite measure of all the deficits a person can have that makes them prone to falls, fractures, to increased frailty, to further falls and further fractures. And it can also be encompassed by the term biological age versus chronological age. And this is also part of our uh, concept of interventions. With that, we have to have multi-targeted uh, fracture prevention. And you can see that a large number of them are actually related to the fall, and some are related to bone. I will not at all address the bone-specific medications, but some of them are actually overlapping. They're being good for the bone, and they're good for the falls. So in all, there are many different areas for studies, and this is actually where we also are lacking studies. Another issue is how quickly can we have an effect of an intervention? And I think this is one of the important issues when we look at older people. And we have comprehensive medical reassessment. This is particularly important for patients who are admitted to the hospital because of a fracture. And we can actually put them in a better situation when they leave than when they came. Part of this is medication review. And the effect, time to effect of these can be days, depending on what drug, or weeks, or even longer, if ever. We have hip protectors. If they're on, the effect is immediate. If they're not on, there is never an effect. Fall prevention for external factors, it's immediate, or maybe never. Falls prevention for internal or intrinsic risk factors, months to years, because it takes a little while for training, for example. We have lifestyle interventions such as smoking. Some of them, the effects are very, it comes very early, but some of them will take years to we have the full benefit. Nutrition, similarly, calcium and vitamin D, and we then have the bone specific drugs. I will go into some of these areas, not all of them, and not comprehensively in all of them, because as you see, it's a very wide variety of interventions that we could be discussing. But I will start out with medication review. This is from the annual report from the Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare, just published. And what you can see here is the use of multiple drugs and suitable drugs or combination of drugs in older, per in older persons over 75 years. And the very good thing here is the drugs that are unsuitable for older people or have been declining over the past 10 years. You see the orange array. Still, the per number of people who still have more 10 or more drugs are quite, is quite high. But the psychiatric drugs are remain at the uh, constant level. And the same report actually says that the number of hip fractures uh, over the past year did not increase in Sweden. I don't know if this is an effect, but it tells us something that it's very good for the uh, patients. We, nevertheless, we can still see a very high use. And this is not the community, the regular community dwelling uh, persons, but these are persons over 75 living in their own homes, but they have social service. And this, there's still up to 24% or to over 20% who have 10 or more medications regularly 
and at least 10% to have uh, drugs that are not suitable for them. But if you are at a care facility, up to 30% have 10 or more drugs. And we can also see that they have a relatively high of 14% uh, psychiatric drugs. So this is something we still have to work with. Possibly some of these drugs are very good for them, but we also have to be aware that they are related to falls and fractures. This is shown in a study from Denmark, also recently published, looking at selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, use in hip fracture patients. And also here, the awareness of when drugs should not be used have clearly increased uh, among both the general practitioners and geriatricians. And we see a constant decline in the use of these drugs over the past 10 years. Uh, there is also a slight decline in the general population. And this is probably also that we, something that we hopefully will then see effects on a reduced number of falls and fractures. So in this, uh, in this Cochrane review, we are looking at medication review versus usual care, usual care at care facilities on the rate of falls. And unfortunately, this uh, summary doesn't show a, a strong effect on them. On the other hand, you can also see that the number of patients in total, when you look, when, when keeping in mind the total number of older people, is relatively small. This is the outcome of, of a rate of falls, but it's very similar when you look at the number of fallers. The review also actually addressed the risk of um, uh, the risk of a uh, fracture, uh, and even not even here can we see an effect. But again, it's only one study, and the number of patients is very small, only 48, or so it's 100 people included in the study. So here we can say we have a lack of evidence, despite the fact that we would think that this is a good intervention. Therefore, here we have a study that's, that's also relatively recently performed in the older adults visiting an emergency department. Uh, they had to be able to walk 400 meters. They were not healthy, but they had a number of multi, they were multi-morbid. And they looked at the false risk increasing drugs and to see what happened they, both for a first fall and a second fall. And actually there was no significant uh, effect of withdrawal of FRIDs. And the authors conclude that in this population of complex multimorbid patients visiting an emergency department because of a fall, our single intervention of FRID withdrawal was not effective in reducing falls. This is in contrast to what we would think, but again, I'm, I think the studies are quite difficult to perform. To give you some positive news is then uh, another uh, systematic review or Cochrane review where the intervention that apparently seemed most efficacious was uh, GP educational programs together with a remedication review and a modifica modification of the prescription. This reduced the number of falls as you can see. And particularly the withdrawal of psychotropic medications reduced the rate of falls. So uh, according to this uh, meta-analysis, we there is an effect of doing this, but it needs to be coupled with education to be efficacious. Heat protectors have been debated, but it's also one of those, if they're on, they have an immediate effect. They could have give you an outer shielding or a padding. And what you see on the right-hand panel is uh, the study by Pekka Canus, where they use hip protectors in a relatively large study population, over 600 individuals and a duplicate controls. And here you can clearly see a reduced risk of fractures in those with hip protectors. This has also been looked at in the systematic reviews. Uh, this is one of the first one, it was done 2006 with the number of the studies that were performed at that time. And 
looking at those data, there seem to be a reduction in fracture rate with, with the use of hip protectors, uh, a 23% reduction of, uh, in the fracture rate. And the, the effect was most obvious when uh, in the cluster randomized trials, which also shows that it's difficult to do individual randomization for this type of intervention. However, uh, recent, the, the later uh, Cochrane review uh, looked at the same issue, and here you can see that the effect is less clear. Again, the most of the studies are relatively small, apart from the Canus and, the, and another study, but it's less obvious to what extent the hip protectors are efficacious. It would seem, however, when you look at it, that if they're on and you're well used, and I think this has been one of the problems that's uh, been addressed in the studies, is the adherence. Because many of the patients included in these studies couldn't put them on themselves and were reliant on staff at their facilities. They also looked at community, uh, people living in the community residence, and here, we cannot see that there is an effect of, effect of hip protectors. Or when it was assessed whether other fractures would be also reduced with the use of hip protectors. The pelvic fracture would be logical, but there was no, uh, it wasn't uh, obvious or there was the data didn't indicate that. Uh, with any strength, that is. So, looking at preventing fractures by preventing falls. Well, I'll start by saying something about frailty, because the falls increase with aging. And frailty is this composite measure that we try to use. And this is a study where we look at 75-year-old women. We have classified them with a frailty score. And as seen here in the panel A, there is a very large proportion who are not frail at all, rather very robust. And we, what we can follow is what happens with them as they age, when they are five years later, age 80, and 10 years later, at age 85. So virtually a, a large proportion will become more and more frail with advancing age, as expected. And what we also can see then is that when you look at, when you are frail, we also, uh, are more likely to have fractures. And this is also in the imminent or short-term perspective, where we can see a, duplic uh, a doubled risk of fracture uh, when you are frail in the, high, the most frail patients in three years and up to five years. So there is a predictive value in trying to assess frailty. And of course, the majority of these fractures, because we see this most for hip fractures, uh, it's, it's, um, it's important to avoid a fall. This is a false prevention program uh, on injury in community dwelling older adults. And the study I showed you before was community dwelling women. They have classified the injurious falls as all falls in the A panel, B, falls resulting in medical care, falls resulting in serious injuries, and falls resulting in fractures. And I will just highlight the D category, the falls prevent exercise on falls resulting in fractures. So this is a study indicating that exercise programs in, uh, in this uh, review uh, suggest that there is a reduction in fracture rates as well as in falls. And this is one of relatively few studies having a power to look at fracture rate as well as falls rate. Uh, this is another uh, study. This is a single study. We're looking at the same thing, physical activity or health education. It's a multi-center, single-blinded, randomized controlled trial. Women were 70 to 89 years old. They were able to walk 400 meters similar to a previous study, quite a large proportion, they got exercise or only health education. They were followed for two and a half years and they had weekly sessions. And here you can see the number of falls and fractures in hospital administrations. But actually, there were, the uh, significant effect was only seen 
in men and not in women. So when looking at the more frail people, those who are at care facilities and hospitals, which is where we have a large proportion of those patients who've already had a fall, particularly a hip fracture. So the, inter the intervention here is exercise, and it can be a variety of exercises in this uh, study. And the immediate, the follow-up was immediate, and at six months post intervention, uh, outcome was the number of fallers. And there was no effect on the number of fallers from these uh, interventions in these studies. And there are at least a, a sufficient amount of about a thousand persons uh, in the intervention group. This also looked at the fracture rates. And the, uh, the outcome was the number of people who were fracturing. But they also looked at the number of people who were falling. And for falls, there was no effect. But for, and for hip fracture, there was no effect. And for all fractures, there were no effect. On the other hand, as you can see, the number of individuals included in those studies is very small. And fractures is a rare event. So it becomes extremely difficult to get significant uh, effects uh, in studies like this. Again, this is a, a looking at the various types of interventions. This is just to show you how you can subdivide then the different studies if they had used uh, gait uh, training, balance training, functional training, vibration, or a combination of them all. So this is on the rate of falls, and the outcome is number of falls. Uh, and here you can also again see there's really no effect when we look at this this way in the studies that are included in this um, Cochrane uh, systematic review. And whether you use the outcome number of fallers, the results are similar. So then those were a variety of training, but then these were designed particularly or specifically for improving balance. And to give you a little background on this one, we have in a study looked at women who have inferior balance with a fracture history versus women without any fracture. And in this study, it's again women who are 75 years of age. And I'd just like to highlight the women in this study who without any prior fracture, this is their romber and this is their gait speed. And as soon as you've had, for example, the most uh, severe fractures, you can see that your balance is reduced and your gait speed is reduced. And your gait speed is quite sensitive to as an indicator of poor balance, because you can see that the, your gait speed re is reduced quite dramatically also for those who, for example, have a proximal humerus fracture. And there are studies showing that if you test gait speed and add it as an additive to the FRAX, the, the, it actually adds to the prediction of, new, of uh, subsequent fractures. Similarly, if we look at these and look at those who have no fracture and those with one fracture, two fractures and three fractures, and we can clearly see that it would have been very logical to start out having interventions in, to improve the balance in these persons. So here is the uh, a Cochrane review of this, where they looked at balance, uh, gait, balance, coordination, and functional tasks versus controls. Again, the follow-up was immediate and six months post-intervention. The outcome on the top is the one uh, single leg stance with uh, time with eyes open. And it, there is an indication that it favors uh, the exercise overall. If the outcome is gait speed, uh, it's uh, similar. There is a, it, it indicates that there is a, a favor for exercise. The similar for the timed up and go test. If instead using strengthening exercise, so this is a different modality, same type of follow-up, and the outcome here again is gait speed, 
we can again see that there is an indication that it might be useful to have this type of training. So this is a way of look, putting it all together to see what happens uh, in the variety of studies, because again, there are so many types of exercise that can be used and it becomes quite difficult to see whether one type is better than the other. And I will come back to that as well. And we're instead looking at gait speed. As I said, gait speed is a quite sensitive test and a very simple test that can be doing and done in virtually any doctor's office. Uh, and the time to effect here is six months, three months or six weeks. And for those where we actually see an effect is that you have to sustain it. You see a relatively quick effect, but then again, you should be continuing for a longer time. Uh, again, uh, but as before, the numbers of studies is limited and the number of individuals included in these studies are small, which highlights the probable difficulty in recruiting patients for participating in studies. However, I know that more recent studies have been performed, so I think that we will get stronger data, uh, giving us more uh, robust evidence of what the, to do and what will be most efficacious. So this is uh, one such study that's more recent on balance training. This is community living women, which is of course also important because it's often that the very first fracture occurs in a community dwelling woman. Hence, we have to look there for the first um, interventions. It's a pragmatic multicenter study with two arms. The women are 75 to 85 years old, a quite large number of 700 women, and duration is two years of sessions. And here you can look at the number of falls and the number of injurious falls. And there is clearly a benefit of the intervention uh, in this study. And it's also showing the cumulative uh, function or between the groups and uh, indicating that interventions with uh, balanced training is probably one of the more efficacious. To summarize this and looking at age and type of intervention in the community, we can look at the rate of falls and the number of fallers. And you can see here that the whether you're above 75 or below 75 doesn't really make any difference. These various types, if you look at all the types of exercise, it is beneficial to reduce the number of falls. However, we don't have the same information on fracture efficacy, which is then something that we will continue to lack, I think. And just for your benefit, to also know what types of exercise have been tested in a more thorough way are, uh, are listed here. And uh, Tai Chi and the uh, balance and functional exercise appear to be the most beneficial, but also when you look at all of them. So as long as you do a variety of them, it's even better. So, Looking into the future instead, what's to come? We think that mobile technologies are on their way and they can actually be used both for the uh, in, in extrinsic and extrinsic uh, variants. Here you can see they can be used for the false assessment, for exercise, for home assessment, assistive equipment and education interventions. And there are people looking into this they think that they can reduce extrinsic factors, but they also have a benefit that we don't have because of lack of staff, that it can enable the patient and the practitioner to interact and collaborate through uh, mobile technology. And because other systems may be more static, and this is something that can provide a more dynamic feedback system when you train. I still think there is a little bit more for to be developed. But you can see the complexity and how people are thinking uh, when it comes to mobile technologies. And this is uh, when you just search for it, you can find there are a number available. Some of them are quite simple. They are just sort of electronic checklists. Others are more advanced that you have them in your pocket and they register what you're doing. 
uh, overall. And uh, such as here, they're now discussing how to standardize the apps that you have in your phone to test your balance. And I think that is probably something we need to look at to have more standardized protocols for this. But so far, no evidence for fracture prevention. And I'm not sure how that's going to come. So then just a few words about exercise and bone mass in older persons. Again, exercise and bone mass are linked. But when we look at it in older women, we see that the correlation between muscle strength and physical activity is much weaker uh, in relation to BMD compared to BMI, which is significantly higher. And that's sort of depressive, I would say. But we also look at muscle strength and physical activity explains less than 1% of BMD in older women. Body weight, on the other hand, as you see here, explains a lot more. So with this, the, the take home message here is that for older people, we might not see a large effect, but the maintenance of bone mass is what we need to look for. And I think that's the, the important message to give our patients. Because, but we can also say the contrast here, when you look in young adult women, we're just doing exercise for recreation, we can see that those who still are active will have a higher bone density. So in the long run, and most of our studies are not long enough to being able to evaluate this, whatever you put in will be, avail will be beneficial for your bone density. And you can combine a number of various exercises that you do over a lifetime that will have an effect in the long run. And you can see on the side here, what types of sports people are using. And this is young women who are 25 years of age. Just one note on vitamin D, because that's a topic from completely different webinars. But I've just looked at them, the number of fract number fracturing and the number of fallers. And I think that you are aware that it would be very logical that these had an effect on both falls and fractures. But uh, according to this, very recent uh, 2018 uh, systematic review, it was not possible to show such an eff effect. So how about social environment? We looked at the intrinsic fact and environmental factors for fracture risk. And again, there are a number of them, and I'm not going to address the uh, shoe wear, eyeglasses, all those things, but I'm looking at something of in the, in the uh, social environment, and this is more within the hospitals. And what this data says is that you have, if you have post-operative geriatric service after hip fracture, there's actually fewer people falling. This says something because this is otherwise one of the risks we know that if you are admitted to a hospital, you are at, also at risk of falling at the hospital and to reduce the number of injuries within the hospital, including fractures, is essential. And uh, this is also then showed an uh, effect on the number of people fracturing, uh, but less pronounced. On the other hand, you see again, the number of people included in these studies is relatively small. They, in, these, in this, they also evaluated the various interventions here with, for example, lower beds, alarms, et cetera, uh, flooring, etc. But there was very small effects on those when looked at them intervention, uh, individually. So when we look at non-pharmacological interventions, I don't know exactly how we should classify fracture liaison service because they are a comprehensive fracture prevention strategy. So I have included a few slides on that because it includes all the non-pharmacological and for some patients, also pharmacological interventions, because every patient should have a non-pharmacological intervention. And this is a, a review, a systematic review made last year, showing that FLS intervention was associated with higher treatment rates by 20 percentage point and a very good number needed to treat. It was also significantly showed a significant increase in adherence by 22%. Now, 
it evaluated pharmacological. But I would assume that this is, like every FLS, coupled with non-pharmacological interventions. So when you use an FLS and add the non-pharmacological interventions, the adherence to those will also increase. And FLS are cost-effective. This is a Canadian study looking at case managers versus active control versus usual care. There is a higher cost when you have a case manager or an FLS. And the comparison here that I have highlighted is when you have a case manager and you compare it to usual care, you can look at the money saved, you can look at the quality of life years saved, which is extremely important for the patient, and the fewer fractures per patient, per 1,000 per patients. And it would also calculate it, uh, what is the, in, uh, the cost effectiveness of case manager or FLS. So I think that we probably need to emphasize more the non-pharmacological intervention in order to gain full, the full effect of fracture liaison services. With that, I come back to the fact that we need to have the multi-targeted view on fracture prevention, including all those areas that we know are related to an increased risk of fracture. We may, however, not be able to prove it with the highest level of evidence while it's logical to do interventions. Such as social life, we know that living alone increases your risk of fracture. There are other things that eyeglasses, external hazards that we haven't talked about. But even so, we know that we, when we combine, we will be more efficacious, and particularly with increasing age of the person. So to summarize non-pharmacological interventions, I would say that the interventions are logical and based on known risk factors. Systematic review highlights few studies in most areas, and the number of people included in these studies are relatively small. This gives us evidence that is not robust for most interventions. And there's obvious uh, heterogeneity within the trials. This is probably related to an efficacy that varies as a consequence of frailty status and age. Nevertheless, I think a person-centered approach warrants a combination of non-pharmacological interventions using clinical judgments while we await better evidence, while I think that we have to intervene without having the highest level of evidence because it is logical to intervene. With that, I will just continue over because it summarizes why it's so important to have a program such as Capture the Fracture, where we are targeting not only uh, pharmacology, but all aspects of intervening, using the best practice framework to set criteria for how we best avoid a second fracture. You know, this material is available in a number of languages so far, and on the web, all of this is there. The criteria are very interesting, and they are actually working virtually everywhere. And as you see, we have false prevention service included, multifaceted assessment, which is also includes that you have to intervene in a multifaceted way, and follow up. And this is even more difficult to follow up how you continue non-pharmacological interventions. And it's, it's very difficult to get return data. It's easy to follow prescription rates. It's very difficult to follow uh, exercise or training among individual patients. Regardless, it should be done. And as you know, the uh, fracture liaison services work everywhere. And we can now say that we have uh, way above 200, uh, 300 FLSs around the globe. And they are increasing. So I can encourage all of you to also enlist if you're not on the map. And the, another uh, part of this is the uh, IOF Global Patient Charter was launched in 2017, which is 
a statement saying that patients should have the right to the most correct and appropriate care whether they've had when they've had a, um, a fracture to diagnosis to care overall and they should we should also include in this the patient's voice where quality of life is among the most important uh, aspects with that also the reduction of pain or no pain so over 89 national societies and organizations have endorsed this and for this we're extremely grateful and with that i'd like to say thank you for having listened to this uh, webinar and we also thank our sponsors which is in this case are the ones on the screen and now it's time for the q a thank you very much thank you very much christina for your presentation um and for effectively covering all the various interventions available. And um, I think uh, you provided a very balanced view on each and every intervention that you covered. Now, we uh, received a number of questions during the presentation, so I would like to dive right into the questions. And I think we have enough time to, to tackle at least four or five questions. Now, starting with the, the first one. So you covered uh, hip protectors, and um, some evidence do show that they might not be so effective, and maybe this is because the compliance rate is low, or also because it might be costly. Now, what is your opinion in terms of how they should be used, when they should be used? How should we maximize its beneficial effect? Uh, I think that the it's probably too, very difficult to use in, for the individual patients living at home. However, in uh, people living in care facilities, there, that's what the indication is from the studies, that that's where they would be more likely to be used. So that would be one intervention, for example, in patients with uh, various degrees of dementia. Where I don't think we're going to get any new trials. So I think we have the evidence we have. Uh, again, it's one of those that are that interventions that are logical, and particularly if you have older patients who have difficulties to uh, comply with exercise programs. Although, when you combine it with exercise, even patients with dementia can improve their uh, balance and coordination with simple training methods. So I think that they have a place, but you have to be selective. Thank you, thank you for your answer. So uh, this is another question and uh, an, uh, an interesting question for some FLS, I believe, especially those who look after dementia patients with fractures. So some key points to be aware of uh, when it comes to providing these non-pharmacological interventions to prevent further falls and fractures in dementia patients. Uh, dementia is is um, is also a spectrum. So in early dementia, it's it's often used that balance training, very simple balance training programs, are actually doing uh, improving the balance very quickly. And that's why the Cochrane reviews are actually looking very shortly after the intervention at the outcomes. Uh, so I think that there is room for at least some balance training and uh, as part of the intervention programs for dementia patients but also as said hip protectors are overall harmless uh, when when they're used properly and there are no side effects so i think they can still also be used in these settings um, so but again i don't think we're going to have evidence and it's very unfortunate because it's difficult to get studies ethically approved among patients with cognitive dis, uh, dysfunction uh, so it becomes very difficult to say anything but what you can use data from other studies and and imply what they how they can be relevant also in other settings thank you for that answer christina now uh, moving on to the next question Resistance exercises are indicated to prevent or treat sarcopenia. Do you recommend resistance exercises at the same time as balance exercises? Uh, 
I think they should be combined. And I, uh, there are studies ongoing not included in any of these, where you can also see that older patients, even uh, those who are in the 90 plus years, when they train at the gyms with machines, they actually have a very good benefit of combining these two. And also the Cochrane reviews that if you combine um, various types of exercise, you improve even more. That's where you reduce the falls. But, but again, the number of fractures, we really don't know very much about because fracture is still a rare event. So it's hard to capture in the studies. Thank you for that. Uh, I think we have time for a few more questions, actually. Now, there's an, there's an intervention called dynamic motion therapy. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't involve any drugs. It's approved and marketed in several countries uh, for, I guess, regaining uh, muscle mass and maintaining uh, muscle rigor. What is your take on this? Any, um, any opinion on its efficacy? I, I don't have any opinion on this. Uh, this and and uh, I don't know how well it's evaluated. Uh, but I think we're going to see newer ways of training, as I raised with the various for example, the mobile technologies. Mm -hmm. But I think also we'll see other techniques that will become available and that are interactive. And for example, there have been as a rehabilitation measures. Uh, I know there are studies, particularly in, uh, in Australia, looking at the uh, Wii training, um, the interaction with both balance and strength. And I think those, uh, as far as I know, these studies are looking at seeing positive results. I see. Uh, thank you for that explanation. Now, uh, two more questions. Uh, so you did uh, cover among the last few slides uh, some of the exercises that are good for fall prevention. In your opinion, uh, which exercise do you recommend and what do you think is the best? <laughs> the uh, if I knew, I would say, but very few of them are tested individually. The only few that have been tested, Tai Chi is one of them. It sure. apparently is one of those that's really effective. But I, I think that there are others and variety of others that will never be tested, including, uh, for example, dance, various ways of dancing. There are new uh, exercise modalities coming up every other week when you look at the exercise or sports literature. Yeah. So I, I don't think we will know, but what these studies clearly show is that you should combine and that balance and function training should be a clear part of uh, the training programs to avoid falls and with falls subsequent, I assume that uh, I, uh, or extrapolate that we will also see fewer fractures. I see. I see. I guess it's a it's it's a really question of finding the right balance and finding the right individual uh, treatment plan. Now, I think we're coming to the the last point, last question here. Uh, so, I think this question will be an interest for most FLS here. Um, having having talked about all these non pharmacological interventions, now what uh, are some senior falls prevention program that you could recommend and any particular protocol in this case that can be used uh, by FLS? I think that uh, that the virtual the physio physiotherapist, since the FLS is a multi multi professional uh, activity, the, uh, the the physiotherapists have programs that are tailored to the specific fractures because you can't have the same program when you've had a vertebral fracture compared to when you've had a distal radius fractures. So assessing the individual person to have a person-centered view on also the training, I think that is crucial. And I, what I showed in one of my first slides is, for example, I think we are missing the point with some of the uh, proximal humerus fractures since they have a very high risk of a new fall. This is probably related to the fact that they can't balance their upper body with their arms because they keep their arm closer to their body so they can't um, they, they are not able to stretch out and protect themselves so that's probably one of the groups we have to develop a new program for but i think the physiotherapists are uh, experts at this and to also uh, 
put these programs into the right type of fracture the patients have had. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I was quite surprised at the, the, at the slide that shows the proportion of different fractures. Uh, I, I, I had the impression that spine fractures would be a lot more, maybe because they're not detected, it just seems lower? They, they, I think that's always the case. So this, sure. is from the, this is from the diagnostic coding, at the, the, the Swedish diagnostic coding. So they are they're verified fractures uh, and diagnostically coded fractures. And of course, they are fewer than uh, than what probably uh, uh, prevalent as as everywhere. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christina. Now, on that note, uh, I will now close a questions and answers session. Thank you all for the question, and also uh, finally um, for your participation in this webinar. We really hope that you enjoyed this session. As with all CTF webinars, we will post the recordings on the webinar page of the TTF website. Now, after this survey, you'll be asked to fill in a survey, uh, and we would appreciate your comments because we are currently uh, finalizing the topics for this year, and we want to give you the webinars that meets your challenges. Now, if you have any more questions or comments, uh, do not hesitate to send them over to capturethefracture at iofbonehealth.org or my email mfujita at iofbonehealth.org. Now, uh, once again, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Christina, special thanks for your time and for the lovely presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, have thank a good evening. Thank you very much. Goodbye now. Thank you.